Today on Cosmic Disclosure, we are with Richard Doty, a retired special agent who served in the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and was intimately involved with UFO ET related content. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Tell us about what you know about Project Serpo. Well, Project Serpo actually is Project Crystal Knight. In, 19, in 2005, I was in a funeral in Washington, D.C. when a colonel came to me and said, Rick, what do you know about Project Crystal Knight? And I said, mm, I don't think I've ever heard of it. What is it? And he told me it was an exchange program between the Ebens, the craft that crashed in 1947, and us and our astronauts. I said, no, I've never heard of that, but I'd be interested in knowing more about it. So we went into another room uh, after where we left the funeral parlor, we had a reception, we went into another room at a hotel and he told me about it. And I, I, I said, boy, that doesn't sound right. I mean, I certainly wasn't around back in the 50s or 60s, but what happened? And he went on to tell me that when the craft, when the Eben craft crashed at Roswell, they found it, they had an energy device in there. And we knew that energy device because we still have that energy device. But the Eben, the Eben 1, told us there was a communications device in the craft, and the communications device could help him notify his home planet to come, come get him, come help me out. And so over a period of about 10 years, it took the US government to create a manufacturer communication system that could send signals to uh, this right. circle, which was the name of the planet the US government named uh, in uh, Zeta Reticuli star system, some 40, about 30, 39.5 light years away. And we did it. We notified them and we, there was a, a progress or a project to learn the Eben language. Now, Eben one started us on that. It was a very difficult language because it was tones. It was a very difficult language to learn, but he, he wrote down his alphabet. So we at least had his alphabet, all the symbols in his alphabet. But we, as a pretty intelligent group of people, figured it out. And we, uh, we were able to communicate with the other planet. Now, this is what this colonel is telling me. Now, in October of 2005, Victor Martinez, he had an e email stream that he used for a number of years, a number of people on that stream. He contacted me and he said, I, I have this guy that's contacted me and said he was with DIA and he wanted to start releasing information about a Project Crystal Knight. Do you know anything about it, Rick? And uh, I said, you know what, Victor, I do know something about it, but you know, I don't know if it's real or if it's a, some kind of military project that had happened, an exercise, or, I mean, I could think of a lot of different things. Right. And he said, no, 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 I know it's real because I, I've seen some evidence of it. I said, what, what kind of evidence did you see? He saw, I saw pictures of the planet. I said, you saw pictures of what planet? He said, Serpo. I said, who showed them to you? He said, this person that I want to introduce you to. So I flew out to, I was still working for uh, Austin, Texas, and I flew out to California, Oceanside, met with Victor, and then I met with this former DIA official named Joseph Yeager. Uh, Joseph knew me, I didn't know him. He knew of me, he knew my, my time in, in OSI and in US intelligence. He had worked for DIA. He was out of the, the, the um, we call it the no hat office in the, C, the, the UFO desk in DIA. And we call it no hat because their heads are so big, their hats wouldn't fit. <laughs> That's what we, it was right. a joke. But sure. anyways, he said, are you ready for this, pro me to, to hear, hear about this project? And I said, well, is it for real? He said, yeah, it's for real. I said, well, you got any documents to prove it? He says, come to my house. And we were at a hotel meeting some in Oceanside, California. Right, yeah. So we went to his house. He lived in a really, really nice house. He had a cellar, and there's not too many places that have cellars anymore, but he had a cellar in his house in California. And we went in there, and he had these safes along the wall, like probably, I don't know, a dozen safes. 
And, you, and they were all GSA approved safes. So they were GSA safes. And having worked in the government, you know how right. secure they are. Yes. He opened one up, brought a document over to me, laid it down. It was an Air Force OSI document. I looked at that document, and of course, I recognized it being I had been in the OSI. He said, read that. And it was a real thick document. So I spent the next probably 30, 35 minutes going through this document. I said, holy cow. I spent all those years in OSI, and I never heard right. about this. So I said, so it's for real. He said, it's absolutely for real. Then he started pulling out other things and showing us, sh showing me and Victor. And I said, well, why do you have it here? I mean, this should be in a file of a DI headquarters. How did you get it? He said, I can't answer that question. He said, and if you turn me over to the feds, those documents won't be here. I said, I'm not going to turn you over to the feds. I said, is this still classified? He said, I don't know. And I don't really care. I want it out in the public. So what was the most powerful thing you read in that document over that 35 minutes? What really shocked you the most, besides you not knowing about it? Well, what shocked me was how they selected the astronauts. How did they? Well, they selected. It took them, it took them months and months and months. But they got people that they had to get specialists, right. the doctors and other specialists. But they went out and found people within the military that were orphans and didn't have any family members and weren't married. Now, that's a difficult task, even in 1960, and this is when this was occurring. Uh, but they found him. They found, I think, 100 or so, and they narrowed it down. Right. They put these, these astronauts through an enormous amount yeah. of training. In reading and then listening to a tape recording later of all the training that they went through, some, I mean, Special Forces see, uh, SEALs wouldn't even gone through this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But they had to prepare them for a journey from Earth, 39 light years away to a foreign planet. How do you prepare somebody for that? Right. Well, they tried it and they did it. I mean, they, they, according to them, they did it. And that was the most fascinating thing, how they, collect, how they chose a 12. Now, the controversy is, according to him, there were 12 men. According to this other person that became involved later, said, no, there were 10 men, two women. There were two women that went. One was a linguist. She learned the even language. So there was some controversy there whether there were two women mm -hmm. or not two women. But anyways, they were trained. They were, they were set up to go on a, on a mission. And the craft, the, the Evens were supposed to come in 1964 to White Sands and Holloman Air Force Base. But that kind of blew up because the one even craft didn't land at Holloman, it landed near Socorro. And that was the Lonnie Zamora incident in 1964. When they eventually found the right landing space in White Sands, it was decided that the Evans weren't ready for it. So then they scheduled it for 1965, and they were going to leave out of Groom Lake, Area 51. And the craft, huge craft, landed about 40 tons of, inf of, of material that we brought on with us, the Evans took, and they, and they went on their voyage, uh, the 12 to Serpil. Did we have any of their races stay back? We had an exchange program. One AT, one ET stay, one EBIT 2, they called him. EBIT 2 stayed, and the tw R-12 went. So, and we had the communications device that we could still communicate with our people on Serpil. We were communicating with them, I think, once every seven months or so, something like that. It took like uh, 40 hours for the signal to get back, something mm -hmm. to that effect. But we still communicated with them. And they adjusted to, eventually adjusted to the, the life on Serpil. And one of the problems they had up there was there was two suns. There was a binary planet. Mm. So there, wasn't any, there was never any uh, darkness. There was always daylight. They took sunglasses with them, and, but the radiation exposure was higher there. The Ebens were accustomed to it. They weren't. So every one of them had a radiation problem, radiation sickness when they got back. And th that was one of the problems. So while you were in Joseph Yeager's you know, cellar looking at all this information, you told me that there was actually pictures he had of the planet. Could you describe what you saw in these pictures? 
the crew, the 12 person astronaut crew took, took a lot of cameras with him. So they took a lot of photography and photos. And he showed us pictures at the, some of, he didn't show us a lot, but he showed us some of the pictures, the pictures of the crew when they arrived on Serpo and pictures of the area that they stayed in for the first uh, year or so. Pretty desert-like. Desert-like? It's okay. pretty desert-like, but there was different areas of the planet that was less desert than where they had landed. That was a central, uh, the, where they landed was a central home area of the, of the Ebens. Over the next year, they realized that they were getting a lot of radiation and their, the heat there was a tremendous amount of heat. So the Ebens decided to move them north. The northern part of the planet was cooler, a lot cooler. In fact, they actually had seen snow on that planet, which was really a, a, a something an anomaly. But they moved north by some hundreds of miles and they set up camp, the Ebens did for them up there. And it was a lot cooler by 30 or 40 degrees. It was still in the 70s, 60s, 70s. But they, they, they were more comfortable there in the, in the northern was part of the planet. And that, those pictures, they, we had pictures of the northern area. They had some vegetation, trees. They had a river. It looked like a river. Um, was there an atmosphere, like a blue atmosphere? Was there was an atmosphere that was consistent with Earth. Uh, it had more of an oxygen to content than Earth, but they adjusted to it. They had these, um, re, uh, I, can't, I can't remember what they called them, but they put these masks on that uh, blocked some of the oxygen that they were breathing because it was a higher oxygen. But eventually, the scientists with them told them, or the doctors with them, we can adjust. We just have to go out for a longer period of time. And, and they eventually adjusted over a period of years. They just adjusted to their... But the one thing they, they really had problems with was the two suns and the heat. You know, the heat, right. daytime heat was, was a constant, 115, 120 degrees. Were there buildings? Were they underground? What did the buildings look like? What the structures? The Ebens lived in almost looked like adobe buildings, They're clay or some type of an adobe building. Uh, the, the crew stayed in an underground bunker and I'm not sure if the Ebens built that or it was already there, but it was cooler the first year. And then, of course, then they moved north after that, and they didn't have a problem with the heat after that. Besides vegetation, were there any animal life or mammal life other than what we see here? Yeah, there, there were creatures on the planet. They encountered, the crew encountered, they were out exploring. And every time they went out, they always had Ebens with them. And we could communicate because some of the Ebens spoke English in a broken manner, but they still could speak it. And the uh, and we had, of course, two linguists that could speak some even. It was it was still difficult for the Ebens to understand. We understood the Ebens better than the Ebens understood us. So in, in their language, but but we, they, we tra they traveled. The crew traveled all over the planet. Uh, they encountered creatures that looked like snakes that were hostile. Some of them weren't hostile. They, they found some animals that looked like armadillos. They found this huge, huge creature that kind of looked like a buffalo in a way, but was non-hostile. Uh, they found some uh, smaller insects. There were some occasions, according to this report, where there were some hostilities that occurred. One particular one was when one of the crew members died. The Ebens took the body. The commander... He said, I want the body back. And they said, no, you can't have him back. And so there was some hostilities and the commander ordered weapons to be issued to everyone. We're going to go get our, get, our body, get our body back. Well, there was one Eben, a female Eben, that was a translator that diffused everything. Mm -hmm. She was a mediator. And according to this report, Every time there was some kind of hostility or argument, she would mediate it and, and settle it. So she, she actually settled this problem before they actually had to break out the weapons. Do they know why this astronaut died? I, I don't, I'm sure it said in there. I, I'm not. I, I'm not no, there was two astronauts remember. that died. Yeah, there was two correct? astronauts that died. One died in a, in a, they had these flying machines, like little helicopters, uh, but they were more advanced than that. Mm -hmm. And apparently he tried to fly one or, and he got killed in a crash. 
Mm. And that was five or six years into the mission. Were they venturing not only on the planet, but off planet, near planet areas? Or no. no. They stayed there the on that planet. Yeah. There was dangers that the Ebens kept telling them, oh, it's dangerous if you go here and go here. And uh, they didn't really know what. But one, one of the things interesting in this report was that the body of the, the body of the American that died was taken into this building. And eventually this, this mediator allowed the, the negotiated the, two of the Americans, the commander and the vice, the, the assistant commander, to go into this bu building to, uh, to, uh, to get the body, and they were going to bury the body. And they saw all these vats. And, you know, they, they, were, saying, they, they were asking the, the interpreter, what are these vats? And when they, when they got up, one of, that American was in one of these vats. He said, we clone, we clone, we're cloning races. Amazing. Were there other races there, Rick, that they were exposed to besides avian? According to the commander, there was many different races that they were cloning. They were doing experiment, biological experiments on all of them. And that's what really upset the commander. He said, you're not going to do that on my, on my crew member's body. But it's something like a, a formal procedure that the Ebens do. Right. One of our got people die, we do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the head Eben said, okay, if you don't want it done, you can take the body and mm -hmm. we'll have a burial. And they did, they did a burial for him. And Were they Ebens spiritual at all or religious? Did they mention anything about, did they have a deity? Yes, they did. They worshiped this deity every day at a certain time. There was a time dial, like an old time dial in the, in the village or in this, in this uh, location, they call it the village. And when it reached a certain place, they would, they would pray or do some kind of religious uh, uh, service to the deity. Now, I don't know that we ever figured out who the deity was or whether it was a god or, or what. I don't know that that was ever mentioned in there. But our people just had to go to their, we couldn't be out when they were doing it. Mm -hmm. We had to, and it was, a, a, it was just a, a, a protocol that, hey, you can't see us doing this. So all our people went to the, or their bunker and stayed a while. And it didn't last very long, according to the team commander who, who who wrote these transcripts that we were reading. Um, did they mention anything about the food or water or did they just ate their own food and water they brought? Well, they, back then it was sea rations and they, they ate, they brought food with them, canned food, but they eventually just ate the even food and, and they had, it was plant-based, almost all plant-based. They had some meat that tasted very funny, but they've adjusted to it. Uh, but if, over a period after uh, I think they, I think they said after a period of a few months, when their bodies were adjusting to this food, they were all right. But but before that, they were getting diarrhea and all, and, and problems with intestinal tract. But eventually, the body adjusted to these plant based and and and, and maybe uh, animal. They had some kind of animal that they used uh, to 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 eat. Rick, how big was this planet compared to Earth, and what was the gravitational pull on that? The gravity was a little bit different, but they didn't, they adjusted. They wore uh, plates in their boots, uh, military mm -hmm. boots, and uh, they, they adjusted to, the, to, to gravity. Amazingly, uh, the, the team commander said, we adjusted. How we adjusted, I don't know, but we adjusted. We, they adjusted a lot of different things, the climate, the other things they adjusted to, but they just adjusted to the, the, to the gravity. The planet was a little bit smaller than Earth, not not much, and I don't know, I don't remember the 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 the, the diameter or or the particulars. What was the culture there like? Do they have restaurants and bars they could go to? Were there athletic clubs? You know, were there spas or pools that the astronauts could mingle in with the other extraterrestrials? No, nothing like this. Everyone looked the same. All the bins looked the same. They all lived in, in these adobe houses, and they had their family, their uh, male, female, and, and children. They never, the crew never saw more than two children to anyone. They weren't allowed in any one of the, uh, the even residents. There was no, everyone ate at a 
at a facility, one facility like a like a dining hall or right. something. Cafeteria. They yeah. didn't eat. They didn't cook their own food. Everyone went to one place. Everyone was rigidly controlled. The team commander said we had they had something like a police force, but there was no hostilities whatsoever. You never saw any fights or any reasons to for the police force to act. In fact, he said the police force were out of sight. If something was to happen, they would they would show up. But and and they did have a military. They did have an air force. They did have a very very uh, 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 sophisticated aircrafts and 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 flying objects they call them and these little helicopters that would fly any place around. Uh, but uh, they never saw any hostile uh, hostilities and all wow. the time they were there. There were no fights, nothing. The one time the police showed up was when. The team commander was going to get the guns to go get the body back. There was some security forces came up and they had weapons, but they didn't bother him. They just, they were this there. The team commander said they were just present. You showed their presence like, here we are. Uh, maybe you shouldn't mess with us or something to that afford, that, that way. But it was a, a u- unique system. Everybody was the same. Everybody went and did this, their eight together. How beautiful. They, they played this game that he was talking about that was something uh, familiar with, uh, something like soccer, but it was totally different. I mean, it was, it was different. It, the closest thing they could relate to. And they would laugh and they would have fun with this game. Well, when the team members went out there and played football or softball, because they brought that equipment with them, they even thought that was amazing. We were try- they were trying to teach the Evens how to play. But in the even game, you didn't catch anything. You let it hit the ground. So in softball, the evens would just watch the ball hit the ground and pick it up. Well, no, no, you're supposed to catch it. And it was difficult, to, 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 according to the team commander. But they tried, and they, and they worked with them. They lived there for 12, 13 years, got along. What propulsion systems did they have to travel 39 light years in just 10 months? We wish we knew. <laughs> I don't think they figured it out. I don't remember a lot of technology being in the report. The, the team commander figured it was the folding the space from one point to another, enabling them to get from one point to another. But this commander detailed the trip in very, very detailed form, art, articulated the, how sick they got from the trip, how disoriented they were, in the craft, didn't know if they were standing up or upside down. And the Evens would come in during the trip and they were, they were strapped to seats and they would give them this, like he, 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 only, he referred to it as like oatmeal, spoonfuls of it. And it immediately settled them. It settled their stomach and it settled them. And it, they couldn't understand how the Evens would know to give this to a human because a doctor on board had other uh, anti-sickness anti-motion sickness medication he could give this crew, but that it wasn't working. What they even gave him was working. Were there other countries involved with uh, the group of astronauts or was it just um, United States, Americans? Just the United States, just the United States. Were you aware of the other countries finding out about this? You know, were they concerned? The Russians found out about it later, some years later. Now, did uh, they do this also with the Russians and other countries? We, we think they did. We, 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 we really think they did it with them and the Japanese, but. What about the uh, Germans? Not, I, I never heard anything about the mm-hmm. Germans, but I heard about. Japanese. The Japanese and the Russians, but I don't have any firsthand knowledge of it. I've heard it, read it, but whether it actually happened or not, I don't know. So what happened to all those astronauts that went to Zeta Reticuli? Like what happened to them to this day? Well, they're all dead now. Right. Um, the, the ones that came back, they were suffering from radiation sickness. They got cancer of the skin or lungs or other, other types of cancers. Uh, one lived, the last one to live was actually the team commander. He lived for a number of years, but then he died about uh, six or seven years ago. And he was the one that spoke at the uh, private UFO convention. Wendell Stevens got him to, to speak at it. Um, what was his name? McKeever. His last name was McKeever. And he was an amazing speaker. 
Uh, he spoke from the heart. He really, really uh, valued the the Ebens. I mean, he they were they were uh, so tender hearted. They were compassionate. Uh, he saw he saw them all in their best. He never saw them in their worst. Even when our team members got so upset with certain other things that were occurring that there were confrontations between the Americans and the, and the Ebens, the Ebens never got upset. There was always a mediation. They always tried to, let's just settle this down. You're our guests here and we'll just, and they always gave in. He said almost every time the Ebens gave in to the Americans, not, not every time, like, when they wanted to visit the structure of the homes of the adult, no, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and, and they warned him not to go in there. And one tried and he was escorted out. And you know, don't please don't do that anymore. But, but they visited their, their industrial center. There was industrial center, not in this village, but some distance away. And all their industry was in, a, in an area, of maybe 10 or 12 miles. They, they made the food, they, they made the aircrafts, they made the, the, anything that they needed was made in this industrial complex. Did they grow their food or 3D print it or maybe make it by some other modality? I don't remember. I think they, I think they grew most of it and there was some canning. Uh, there, was some, there was a facility they used to make mm -hmm. other, other food. The food lacked taste. <laughs> The, the first thing they ran out when they started eating the Eben food was salt and pepper. And they, I think they took some other stuff with them, uh, Tabasco sauce, probably because that was in the sea ration even back yeah, then. Right. But they ran out of that because the Eben's food didn't have any taste. Mm. But they developed a way, they, you know, ingenuity, while they were up in the northern part of the plant, they found a plant, plant they could chew on and it was mint flavored. Well, they asked the Eben's, is, is this good? And the Eben said, yeah, if you... It, it won't hurt you, and be, even make some, made some of a, something out of it. So they, they were, and they they figured, and then they determined if they heated it, it would taste differently. So they made their own spices, basically. Amazing. Yeah. What was the main accomplishment of the U.S. government to do this project? I think it was to uh, to to obtain technology, advanced technology from the Ebens. The Ebens are 5,000 years ahead of us, so, you know, we could learn a lot from the Ebens. The problem is they were teaching us, but it was so far advanced that we just couldn't understand it. Like, the, the, the commander uh, talked, told a story about going in to a school, and they had schools, and trying to teach our algebra to the Eben kids. And of course, it's, it's Greek to them. They, they didn't understand what we we're trying to say. But almost every one of them realized what they were doing. Ah, you're trying to teach us math. So then they even started teaching us their math, which was ad more advanced, different symbols and things. But, but we, the, especially the scientists on the team, started grasping it. Oh my gosh! Yes, I can understand this now. I can understand this now, and here, 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 are these scientists that have doctorate degrees are going back to grade school or whatever school that whatever grade they're, they're the Evens are learning in, and learning their math, and learning their culture, and learning their alphabet. If they were so advanced, you say five thousand years more advanced than we are. You know, why were they doing things like growing their own food and not just replicating it? I mean, they're cloning bodies. Obviously, they're probably cloning food. I don't know that they could answer that question. That's a different, I mean, they're different race of, of creatures from another planet. So very difficult to compare. And one of the things the commander says, it told his crew is we have to forget what we did on planet Earth and forget the customs, the the, the procedures and the courtesies and we did. This is a new world. We have to learn their way of doing it. And so, you know, their way is maybe in technology more advanced, but in other areas, maybe it's less advanced. And another thing, 
they they did that the the commander I remember reading about was toilets. They would save their their wastes, and at a certain now their days were thirty six hours. At a certain time, there would be a vehicle that would come up and collect all the waste, and and was it? They could never figure out whether it was being used for fertilizer or whether it was being recycled some way. Was it, were they using it in some of They could never figure this out because the Ebens wouldn't allow them to go to the industrial complex. They went there to view it, but they, they only went there once or twice. And when they moved up north, it was so far away they couldn't, they couldn't get to it. But they don't, they don't know why they did that. Did they collect the humans' waste too at the same time? They, they collected human waste too. That's the, that's the next thing I was going to tell you. Mm. They would come down and ask for our waste. And, and I guess the commander would say, yeah, you want it, you can have it. And there, were, mm. there was and another thing that Evans did was they made toilets that were different than they had for the, for the crew, which were more like American toilets than the Eben toilets. And the, and the commander says, how do they know what our toilets are like? They must have been visiting Earth a lot. I mean, they must have been in houses, you know, human houses to see that we have a toilet like this. It's wow. amazing, amazing. Do you have any information about the different race races of Ebens? Because people are saying they're being abducted by the small greys and others say they're very helpful. You know, do you think it's the same race? I don't know that for a fact. I, I've never been briefed in, but I... I surmise they were different. I don't think the Ebens yeah, were agree. hostile or anything like that. I think the other Greys are different. Diff, different. Now, what the Ebens did was they cloned and they created biological, other biological entities, even robotics. I mean, because Americans on the planet saw these robots and asked the Ebens, "What are these things? Oh, they're robots. You know, they're, they're they don't worry about it. They're not gonna hurt you. They're just robots. We created them." But they looked like humans, so they were a, they were a bi biological entity, but they were a robot, and and so if they if they could do that, they could maybe make something else, uh, maybe the other grades. I don't know. That's what I I think, and that's only my opinion. No, I don't I know agree that with for that. a fact. I definitely agree with that. Did we learn anything from uh, being with the Ebens about our history, where we came from? That is an extremely controversial subject. Or, or a question, because the Ebens told us they've been visiting Earth for approximately 2,000 years. So that brings up a whole lot of questions about the religious aspect of, of Jesus and, you know, was Jesus a spaceman? I don't know that answer, and I'm not going to even dwell into it. But that brings up some questions, and I don't have those answers. I don't know. I don't know that we ever, they told us that they visited Earth uh, 2,000 years ago. In fact, they gave us the Yellow Book. The Yellow Book is a holographic device that if you look at it, it, you have to be sitting in front of it to look at it, and it recorded the Eben history, including Eben's history of Earth. Now, what the ironic part about this book is if you're German and you were looking at it, you'd hear everything in German. If I was a Russian, I would hear everything in Russian. Consciousness-assisted technology of exactly, some sort. Exactly, yeah, something, right? something like that. Was there anything else that we learned about ourselves and our history from this book? Yes, but the problem is, I don't know of anyone that actually were able, was able to get through the entire history of, of the Yellow Book. I mean, the problem with it is I, I never saw it, I never, I never used it, but the people that have, including a very good friend of mine who was able to look at it. And he sat there for several hours. If you put it down and put it back up, it starts all over again. It doesn't, it doesn't read that the fact that you want to start it, and there's no buttons or anything to, to push. So it might be impossible to sit for you know, 100 Enough. days or whatever yeah. it is to, to look at the whole history of what the Ebens have recorded on this in this yellow book. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I know uh, other researchers, such as Linda Moulton Howell and some others, have, have dwelled into that more than, than, than I've heard of. 
but but that's all I've read about it. It didn't go into a lot of details about the Yellow Book. Or our history. The commander never said no. they spoke about our history or... Only that they've been visiting Earth for 2,000 years. But I don't know that there was any anything brought up about that that I could remember. Is it possible when they came to visit us that they got into some sort of genetic, you know, mutations or growing of beings or even hybrids? That's been, that's been discussed. I, I don't know any, I, I don't know the actual answer to that. I, my own personal feeling is it probably, probably did. I think their, their, their mentality, the Evans mentality, what I read out of these documents is that they're going to do what they have to do to survive or create a, a guarding force or whatever, because they had a, one thing that we did find out, they had a, uh, a battle with another planet. The hundreds of thousands of Ebens were killed, and they finally made peace with that planet. It was in the same system, the solar system. And uh, that's how, and, and they have, they've maintained the peace with this other planet. Now, uh, were they Ebens too? No, they were a different race. Uh, but, but some of those from the other planet, is what the commander is saying that the Ebens are cloning. So they have a safeguard. They're safeguarding just in case. They're going to do what they have to do to survive. Every planet's going to do this. The problem with our planet, we have so many different races, so many different countries. Their planet, they have one race, Ebens. That's it. There's no other races on that planet. They wouldn't allow any other races on the planet. And they wouldn't allow... Uh, crossbreeding either. That's one of the things that our scientists thought about doing and either artificially mm -hmm. or or not. And, and they even said, no, there's no way you're going to do that. And we accepted it. So the Ebens are going to do what they have to do to protect themselves. Protect that race. Yep. What happened to the Ebens with Project Serpo? Are they still living amongst us today? Well, Eba 2, as far as I know, is still here. He's still out at Area 51 now. As of 1991, he was. Now, I don't know where he's at now. Did they ever mention their lifespan? They have a long lifespan, about seven to 800 years. Well, we found out that according to the, to the even uh, time period, time frame, they could live six or 700 years in even time. Now, I don't know if anybody actually sat down and figured out what that is in human time, but uh, they can live a long time. Now with Project Serpo becoming public, do you believe this is a soft disclosure? Well, Serp Serpo became public a long time ago, and there's been a lot of controversy about that ever since. And one particular Air Force general said it's hogwash, never happened, but another government employee came forth and said it happened, but there were only three astronauts that went. So there's controversy. And I think the DIA placed the controversy in there for the disclosure aspect of it. We don't know the was there three or were there twelve? Did they you know did did they actually go or was this some sort of a major plot to condition the public for a future disclosure. I mean, there's a lot of questions about Project Serpo that has never been answered. There's a lot of conjectures here and there. There's a lot of uh, misinformation here and there spread by people writing books about it that don't really know the truth. But the truth, if you go back and look at the documents, you're going you're gonna to be fascinated by the details that this commander put in there. And some of the things he's describing, you can't, you can't be here on Earth and describe some of this stuff that he's describing. So even the best scientific, a science fiction writer couldn't write a Project Serpo book. Right. I mean, this stuff is, is as real as it can get. When you were in the basement reading that document that you were privy to, did it state how many astronauts in that document went? Twelve. Twelve. To women. And to the best of your knowledge, that was an official OSI document. Absolutely. It was a, a, a headquarters number. It was numbered. It was a document. Mm -hmm. was, it was headquarters. Uh, it, was the, it was the after action report for it. 
they, they, they had an initial report that was dated in 1965 that was preparation report. It was counterintelligence operation. And then the 1980 report was a debrief and an after action report. They came back in 77, but by the time they interviewed everybody, got all the facts, the, the report is uh, numbered in 1980. The first two numbers of the report is the year. Right. So it's, it's 80 headquarters D 839 I think two. And that's the number of the report. Where did they return in 1977? Where was that meeting spot? Actually, they came back to Tonopah, a place called Wellington. It's an, it's an area, uh, an old mining camp on Tonopah, on, on a test range. They have a, uh, a very secretive, uh, it's naturally enclosed like a coliseum, and they landed inside that. And uh, I'm sure they had safeguards for satellites and so forth. That's where they landed in 1977. So in your mind, would you say Project Serpo was a 100% legitimate program? I wouldn't say 100%. I'd, I'd say it was probably, I'd say 80%. There's some, still some questions about the numbers that went. Sure. Even though the official report said there were 12, right. there were other people who were associated with this that have since died, but said, no, no, we only sent three. Hmm. So, you know, that's, and there's some other, some of the, some of the equipment that was taken, there was a conjecture about, no, 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 we didn't take that. We took this. And there was a, in the, in the official report, they, they took a, uh, uh, atomic demolition munition with them, a small atom bomb. It's just a one kiloton, but they took, well, the other guy said, no, we didn't take any atom bombs with us. <laughs> so... There's a little bit of back yeah, and forth. Yeah, a little back, back and forth. But overall, I think we had an exchange program. Right. How many went? How many came back? I don't know. Rick, what a stellar story and what an amazing amount of intelligence you just offered us in the audience. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much. I'm Emery Smith, and this is Cosmic Disclosure. Until next time.